Hi! And welcome back to Sinister Sisters. Hello! I am Kat, and I am joined by my co-host, Shrimp! Who said she was going to stop singing, but <laughs> clearly I lied. lied. <laughs> I lied! So, this is the very, very last episode of season one. Yay! Um, so, as a little segue into the side note have you ever seen the word segue spelt out yeah it is like segui or something segui yeah i thought it so, was literally s-e-g-w-a-y me segway. too Seg it's seguge. not seguge. hate so, it uh season two which we will be starting next week and next week, we actually have a very exciting bonus episode coming Ooh. as well. Because so, it's Halloween! Anyway, so <laughs> as a segue into our season two, which is going to be on Devious Duos, today on Soapbox Sunday, we're talking about uh, why people kill in teams. Why do people we... kill as combinations? We love a fucking alliteration over here. We do. Devious duos on Soapbox mm. Sunday, True Crime Tuesday. Mm. I'm so satisfied. I have so much serotonin. <laughs> Those are buzzwords. So today we're talking about the, the, the science or the psychology behind teams of murderers, people who murder together. Devious um, duos, if you will. Devious duos, if you will. <laughs> and, and so, you know, I personally, as a non-murderer, cannot imagine <laughs> being uh, approached by somebody who says, hey, dude, you want to go and just, like, murder Jimmy? And then going along with it. Let's I go don't, kill a guy. <laughs> I just, I cannot fathom that. Um, so I wanted to do a bit of a deep dive. Sorry, my little doggie is sitting next to me and she keeps staring into space. So producer nova is looking at ghosts probably foreshadowing for the special secret episode mm -hmm. anyway so i wanted to do a deep dive into why why these situations happen so love it um as with <laughs> the rest of the human experience the psychology here is very very complex and is contributed to to by a lot of different factors and there are a lot of reasons why people might find themselves in these relationships where they kill people for fun um <laughs> so um about a fifth of serial killers so 20 about 20 percent of serial killers operate in teams and mostly those teams involve two offenders so typically there is one dominant figure in the relationship uh, and that dominant person looks for somebody who's very deeply insecure and often exploits factors like youth or mental instability, low intelligence to kind of hook that second person in. In uh, an analysis that was done of more than 500 serial killer teams, each one of them had a person who maintained the psychological control. So this can happen for like a variety of factors. The murderous duo relationship is largely categorized by a really strong interdependence in which both of the parties need something critical from the other person. So for example, the dominant person requires the more submissive person to be fully loyal and to validate their need to murder or to do commit crimes, while the following person needs the power and authority of the dominant person and they may rely on them for things like money food and emotional validation especially in cases when it's a romantic couple mm. uh, and this kind of relationship creates the perfect storm for the dominant party to fulfill their devious wishes while the other person just gets sort of dragged along for the ride so this pattern of behavior really follows closely or similarly to the pattern of behaviors that we often see with abusive relationships um so often there is this um, power dynamic of the more dominant figure who uh sort of uses basic life necessities like food and, and money and 
and love as um, something to hang over the other person to get Lovely. them to go along with what they want them to do. Most of, specifically now within these murder duos, most of the individuals that fulfill that submissive or follower role are middle class women with family backgrounds of physical or sexual violence whose male partners have transformed them through a series of steps. Like Alcoholics Anonymous, but less good for you. Yes, much worse for you, but similar. So firstly, the man, we're going to call the person a man just because that's most common. Um, So the man would identify the vulnerable individual. They would then seduce them with gifts and praise while isolating them from others and eroding their boundaries. Mm. This initial show of love is a ploy to acquire information that the dominant party can in the future use as leverage. They then often introduce sexual acts that are outside of the woman's experience. And once they obtain compliance for these acts, uh, the deviance becomes part of their routine. They then can increase their partner's dependence on them and restrict their outside contact um, and sort of pull them even further away from, you know, their loved ones or just kind of general society. Mm. And then by this point, the dominant individual, the the man, man, um, has now created the ideal accomplice for their murderous acts. So in these situations, when it's sort of this dominant submissive pairing, um, the accomplice's motivations to participate in the murder are often very complex. And they tend to range from love of the other individual, the, the dominant party, all the way to fear for their own life or for that of their children. Some of these individuals seem to adopt distancing mechanisms, such as disassociation, or simply just looking away from the violence as it occurred. So they're, you know, sort of being able to cognitive dissonance to be able to accept what their, you know, partner or parent or whatever is doing. Generally, they have to agree to something that they fundamentally loathed previously, like harming or killing another person in order to acquire something that they need or that they crave. So security, social status, love, you know, those other things that they've become dependent on with their, um, with their partners. So just sad. Very. Yeah. Um, It is important to note also that these tactics are also common in non-romantic partnerships of the murderous variety. Um, but what each person would gain from the relationship would then vary slightly in that sense, if it's um, a slightly different relationship. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, very sad. Mm-hmm. But it's not the only factor that contributes to these duo, murder duo partnerships. So something else that's also often attributed to murderous pairs is something called a folle à deux. Folle à deux. F- French for folly of two. How cute. Um, its official name is not cute. It's not cute oh, at all. Never mind. It's not cute. <laughs> its official name is shared delusion disorder. So, oh. yeah. <laughs> not cute. <laughs> um, we see this. It could in... be if your delusion was cute. Yeah. Not in this case. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if your delusion was that, like, the world was great and peaceful and all loving then yeah that's probably a good thing um so many violent criminals both within these murderous duos and individually will attribute their own violent behaviors to delusions that they experienced while participating in the violent behavior it isn't really clear um the research it doesn't really agree if there is a higher prevalence of violent behavior in those who have a mental disorder that would cause delusions. Mm. The relationship between serious mental illness and violence is very complex, and the subject generates a lot of debate from, you know, the medical community as well as the general public. Um, And this is, you know, largely due to the fact that because 
you, typically there is a really long period of time between crimes being committed and a psychiatric evaluation of those individuals who committed crimes. It's really yeah. difficult for researchers to actually establish reliable relationships between crime and mental illnesses or um, psychopathology. Mm. So it does seem, it seems that most people can somewhat agree on this, um, that anger that comes along with delusions seems to be a pretty key factor in that relationship between violence and acute psychosis. Um, but it's not, it's not obvious how much of this, you know, can be contributed. So, yeah. um, so with shared delusion disorder, the symptoms of delusions that might come along with, um, from, from one individual are passed from, from that person to another. So the main contributing factor to this disorder, um, or factors to this disorder seem to be stress and social isolation. So people who are isolated together tend to become more dependent on each other. And that can lead to the person, the, in, the inducer of the delusions, um, having more of an, an influence. Okay. Yeah, and having more of an influence on the other individual. Um, additionally, people who develop shared delusion disorder do not have other people reminding them that their delusions are delusions. And yeah. so um, it can become more you know, more um, easily embedded into that person's sort of psyche. Hmm. Stress is also another factor that's contributed to this. So the majority of people who, you know, is a very common factor in all mental illnesses developing or mental illnesses worsening. And so mm -hmm. the majority of people who um, develop the shared delusion disorder are either uh, genetically predisposed to mental illness in some way or have undergone a really extreme amount of stress combined with this social isolation with this other person. Um, when people are stressed, uh, their adrenal gland will release more cortisol, which is the stress hormone, into the body, mm -hmm. which increases the brain's level of dopamine. I sort of feel like we may have talked about this previously, um, but once dopamine levels get really high it actually damages the brain's ability to um pick up dopamine so it, it changes the chemistry oh, nice. of your brain so you can be too happy yes thanks god <laughs> um, yeah and so you can be happy but not too happy because then i'm gonna happy. ruin your chance to be happy ever again yes also the same with serotonin actually if you it, this is like much more common I would say with people who use uh, use a lot of drugs, but if you use drugs that really increase your dopamine, like uh, methamphetamines or uh, your serotonin levels, like um, ecstasy, things like that, you can actually get to the point where your body doesn't know how to create its own happiness anymore, and you just oh, can never be happy ever again. Even if you so. take like prescription medicants. I think it helps, but um, most antidepressants are not, they don't create serotonin. They just help your body pick more up of it and bring more of it into your brain. So, oh shit. Yeah, you need, you need some serotonin there. So, That's don't do sad. drugs, kids. Or at least then don't you'll do never lots be happy of drugs. again. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so this um, increased tolerance, I guess, for dopamine inside your brain is strongly linked linked to the development of mental illness, especially um, disorders that include delusions. So shared delusion disorder is most commonly found in women who have slightly above average IQs and who have been isolated from their families and then who are also in relationships with that dominant person who has delusions. The majority of people who develop shared delusion disorder also meet the criteria for dependent personality disorder mm. which is characterized by a pervasive fear that leads them to need constant reassurance support and guidance from another person Aww. yeah and so if two people are having a shared delusion of something and if you know delusions are often at least anecdotally connected to crime then that makes those individuals more likely mm. 
to commit crimes as a doer. Um, nice. And again, like the, the the common the common person there is, is very similar, right? Yeah. Average IQ women um, who have a dependence on the other partner for whatever mm-hmm. reason. So, yeah. And then the final factor that we're going to talk about today. So this obviously isn't an exhaustive list by any means, but the the final factor that we'll touch on today is Stockholm syndrome. So Who's Stockholm syndrome. That? Shadow holding me hostage. I've been here for days. Who's this whisper telling me that I'm never gonna get away? You know they'll be coming to find me soon. I fear I'm getting used to being held by you. That is a fucking bop. Anyways. I was waiting for the One Direction <laughs> tie in here. So thank you for meeting my expectations. <laughs> Exceeding my expectations, really. Once a directioner, always a directioner. <sighs> Hashtag One Direction. Hashtag Refresh, not Replay. When One Direction was a oh. thing, um, yeah. and they released music videos, the goal was to get that music video to the mo- like a record amount of views in 24 hours. Mm-hmm. And YouTube didn't count them if you refresh, if you replayed the video, so you had to refresh the tab instead. Oh, that's very niche. <laughs> so true, friends. You know what to do with our YouTube videos. <laughs> yeah, refresh. Refresh, don't replay. Don't replay. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> okay, so we're going to talk about Stockholm Syndrome. Stockholm Syndrome is a psychological response to being held captive. Um, so people with Stockholm Syndrome form a psychological connection with their captors and begin to sympathize with them. And this also... Um, doesn't necessarily have to be specifically in like a traditional kidnapping type of situation. It's also been um, observed in abusive relationships as well and can uh, uh, include, sorry, other types of trauma where a bond is made between a person who is abusing and the person that is being abused. Many medical professionals consider the victims' positive feelings towards their captor or to their rewards or their abuser is a coping mechanism that is used to help them to survive the days or weeks, years of the trauma or abuse that they're experiencing. So it's a mechanism in your brain to help you survive, basically. That's sad. It is, yeah. Um, The condition itself gets its name from a bank robbery incident that happened in Stockholm in 1973. So there was a six-day standoff where um, there were some captors, had had bank employees um, inside the bank with them for six days. Jesus fuck. Yeah. Um, And so during that time, the many of the the bank employees became really sympathetic with the bank robbers. After they were set free, after the standoff was was finished, the bank employees, a lot of them, refused to testify against the robbers and even raised money to aid in the robbers' defense. Oh my. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, this sometimes happens with criminal cases as well. Um... And and a theory as to why people develop Stockholm Syndrome is that it is actually a learned technique that was passed down to us from our ancestors. Mm. In a lot of early civilizations, there was always a risk of being captured or killed by another social group as kind of vying for, you know, power, that sort of thing. Mm. Producer Nova is back. Hey, girl. Better than ever. She's mad because I'm down here and not paying attention to her. (laughs) Um, yeah so um it is believed that it's a learned technique from our ancestors if you were able to be captured by another social group 
and then able to bond with the captors, it increased your chance of survival. So, sad. Some, yeah, but it makes sense. Yeah. Um, some evolutionary psychiatrists believe that this technique is a natural human trait, and we all possess it in in some in some sense. Mm. Another theory as to why some people develop Stockholm Syndrome and not others is that um, people adjust their feelings over time. And so they start to have compassion for their abuser or their captor when their abuser shows them some kindness um, throughout Mm. their time together. Also, another theory is that by working with and not fighting against the captor, victims may be able to secure their safety. And then when they're not harmed by their captor, they may feel grateful or even view the captor as humane. So it's a very interesting phenomenon. Mm. Um, And I I think it would be confusing to be the victim Mm. because it's 2022. We know that like bank robberies aren't cool and abuse isn't cool, but you still feel kind of like, well, maybe they didn't do such a bad thing. You know, I think that would be very confusing. Yeah, I think especially in uh, cases like bank robbery that are, you know, typically non nonviolent crimes. Um, yeah, I mean, it's fucking expensive to be alive. Like, I totally yeah. can see why you would want to try doing that. Um, Me too. I mean, it's a bad idea. You're not going to succeed. Banks have a lot of safety precautions in place these I mean, days. Maybe but... you would have succeeded in the seventies. Yeah. So, like, I mean, go off, queen. If you want to take me captive yeah. and try to get your bag, just don't beat me up. Don't you kill know? me either. Well, that was heavily implied, but <laughs> a really famous case that involves Stockholm Syndrome and uh, committing crimes is the mm. case of Patty Hurst. So, she was 19 years old when she was taken hostage, I guess. Um, and she is the granddaughter i believe of a this is this is an old case but she was a granddaughter of um, a well-known publisher at the time yes so she lived with her captors for over a year and Mm. although she um during her captivity was raped tortured and isolated she eventually announced that she would be joining her kidnappers to become a revolutionary she took part in bank robberies, traveled around the country with her captors, and promoted their propaganda. She was actually eventually ir- er- she was actually eventually arrested with the the other group of revolutionaries, <laughs> um, and was put on trial. At her defense, she claimed that she had been brainwashed by her kidnappers. And this could be seen in the fact that when she was arrested, she weighed only 87 pounds. Ooh. When she took an IQ test, there was a very shocking 18-point drop in the 19 months that she had been held captive. Ooh. Which is a lot. Like, a lot, okay. a lot. Uh, IQ tests are so hard. Yeah. Like, I've tried taking, like, just online, like, free ones, just so that I can be smart or whatever but they're so hot like the... if this triangle is yellow and this one is the number 42 and this one is an inchworm what is this one i don't know <laughs> how is that logic <laughs> well i think i don't know about the online ones but i think if you actually were assessed by like a psychologist or a psychiatrist mm-hmm. ma'am I think I might have just outed myself as having a low IQ. No, I think if you, you're actually assessed by a mental health professional, then they look at how you try to solve the problem. Oh. Rather than like the actual answer. The answer is not important. What's important is how you like, yeah, get to that's the fair. answer. That's fair. I once went to a job interview and they were like, explain the color red without using any colors. Or saying the color red. And that was kind of Vibrant. It is the color of love. But also anger. And death. The sun sets. And also the sun rises. Mm. It is the color of beginnings. As well as being the color of ends. 
It is cyclical. You can buy my poetry book on Amazon. <laughs> Link is in the a Instagram true bio. Fact, actually, Shrimp has a poetry <laughs> book, so that's cool. Um, so Patty Hurst was actually eventually charged with crimes Ooh. related to this um this incident, but she eventually was released from prison when then president jimmy carter commuted her sentence she served i think just over a year and mm. she was exonerated by bill clinton when he was president so. i did not have sexual relations with that woman <laughs> thanks bill <laughs> So those are some factors that can contribute to people committing crimes, killing Jimmy with their friends, you know. Um, yeah. So Literally as died. we progress through the season, we'll see a lot of really interesting examples of this phenomenon. And also um, we'll dive into more, you know, some more of the reasonings um, as they occur on like an individual level. Noise. Yeah. Thank yeah. you, friends, for listening. Thank you so much. Please follow us on Instagram, which is at sinistersisters.podcast. Yep. Check us out on YouTube or on your favorite audio platform, depending on where you're witnessing this at the moment. TikTok. Nova's having a shit fit in the back. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. She's literally flipping out. Um, yeah. Follow us on TikTok, which is Sinister Sisters Podcast podcast yes we'll be posting some sneak peeks of episodes before they go up on there and also some of the funny snippets from the episodes um, as we go and you can also email us at sinister sisters pod at gmail.com so you can use that email to say hey to hey. request case cases yeah. which you can also do with the case request form which is yeah. featured in our show notes or the description box down below <laughs> also it's in our instagram bio so. nice let us know what you think give us a five star rating on apple Podcasts, spotify all the other ones yeah comment on our instagram posts yeah it really helps with our engagement if you save yeah our posts. save our posts it costs you nothing it costs you nothing to support your favorite creators shop small and by Shop local. local. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye, friends.